So I have 15 or 16 slides, um, but I have been able to barter some extra time from Angie here, um, but I will try to go through this as quickly as possible. Um, in preparing for the presentation today, it really provided an opportunity to do some reflection um, on JCD's policies and practices and to consider how they shape the content of the work that's published in the journal, who's making these contributions, and the professional perspectives that are represented in these publications. In my presentation today, I'm going to give you a brief overview of JCD because I know a lot of people are not um, very familiar with the journal. Um, I'm going to talk about the relevance, um, challenges, and opportunities to integration of theory, research, and practice in the journal, and we'll end with some recommendations um, for JCD practices in the future. So JCD was established at the University of Missouri in 1972 under the title Journal of Career Education. Um, MU's Department of Practical Arts and Vocational Technical Education, which no longer exists today, received funding from the Education Professions Development Act and held regular seminars on vocational education topics. JCD was actually developed by a group of graduate students who were in these seminars. Um, and the original focus on career education really reflected the emphasis um, within the field at that time on vocational education training. There are two aspects of JCD that I think are unique from some other journals. Um, <clears throat> one of them is the editor history and the other is the lack of affiliation with the professional association. Um, so first, although JCD has had a long history, um, there have only been three editors um, to the journal. Um, Hercules Kazanis, I tried Googling him to see if I could come up with a picture um, of him, but I couldn't. Um, Norm Geisber is a beloved colleague of mine at the University of Missouri who just retired, um, was editor of the journal from um, 78 to 2006 for 28 years. Um, and I've been doing this since 2006, already longer than I think I expected to um, going in. But under Norm's um, uh, editorship, in 1984, he changed the, the name of the journal from Journal of Career Education to Journal of Career Development um, to expand its focus and also to expand the audience. Um, and the second thing that he did is, um, he, the, in 1985, the publishing side was moved from an in-house operation um, to a professional publishing company. The second unique aspect that I had mentioned is that it's not tied to a professional society. And there are clearly some downsides to this, um, including subscription rates, visibility, um, that also might have an uh, impact on the number of submissions um, that we receive. But there are also some advantages to this as well. Um, I don't have um, any pressure in, in terms of um, uh, profit for the journal or re achieving certain metrics for the journal and I also have the flexibility of being able to cover a controversial topic um, if one came across my desk. The journal since 19, 2006 was moved to Sage Publishers um, and also since that time we have expanded the editorial board team um, to include two associate editors. The number of journal pages has increased and we've also moved from um, a quarterly to a bi-monthly publication. JCD is ranked in applied psychology journals. Let's see. And um, in 2014 had a five-year impact factor of 1.0. So I think to, um, to summarize, JCD really strives to provide the most up-to-date concepts ideas and methodology and career development, theory, research, and practice. Um, so now with that backdrop on the history, um, I'm going to now address how the journal's policies have shaped the integration of um, theory, research, and practice in our publications. And to identify either where we are or are not lacking in that process, I review JCD's descriptions, um, our policies related to manuscript submission and evaluation of manuscripts, and practices for selecting members of the editorial board and ad hoc reviewers. So JCD's published aims for the journal highlight the centrality of career development research theory and practice and clearly emphasize that public, that practical applications must be presented in any manuscript that is submitted for publication. 
JCD is explicit in its expectation that manuscripts integrate theory and practice or th research theory and practice, and that's also reflected in the evaluations that our external <coughs> reviewers use to um, assess manuscripts. Um, an analysis of JCD publications um, from inception to 2007 um, indicated that the majority of publications during that time um, were conceptual in nature, and just over 33 uh, percent were empirical. That's really flipped around um, since I became editor, and I think that reflects um, my own biases and my own strengths um, as, a, as a researcher, but that also, I think, can also limit the potential submissions that we get from the journal from um, practitioners. And um, this just reflects that these are the two most highly cited um, JCD publications that I think reflect a combination of both, re an integration of both research and practice, which similar to JCA um, uh, represents the majority of publications in JCD. Um, and these are just some examples of, um, I think similar to what was mentioned by the previous um, presenters, it's rare that a research manuscript is gonna be accepted in JCD if it's not grounded in theory. Um, and we also um, will not accept uh, research manuscripts that don't attend to um, the practical implications um, of the data. Um, this represents some um, articles that reflect the integration of research and theory in JCD publications. Um, these are research and practice um, examples. And then we have a few um, publications that address an integration of theory and practice. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to the challenges to integration. Um, one of the challenges that, um, that we have is really having the, the perspectives, um, a broad array of perspectives of vocational psychologists represented both on our editorial team and in the authors who are submitting practices. And I think this is mentioned several times yesterday. Um, the majority of those individuals um, are individuals who have research um, backgrounds um, and who are faculty at research universities. Um, it's difficult to enlist the participation of career counseling practitioners in other role or professionals in other roles to serve as reviewers or to develop manuscripts because these are activities that often aren't required for their position or they just may not have an interest in pursuing those professional activities. Um, our, our knowledge base is really lo limited to the extent that those of us who are doing research um, may not be aware of the cutting ed edge practices or ways in which technological advances are influencing career counseling practices. Um, and so those practice implications that are being suggested by researchers who are conducting the studies may not have the impact that, that they're intended to have because of our distance from um, practical activities. Another limitation, another challenge, and I think was mentioned um, yesterday by Nadia and some others, was the um, few opportunities for collaboration between researchers and practitioners. Um, and it's really important that we find ways um, to try to bridge that gap and, and strengthen scholarship overall um, within the field. I think some of um, Ryan's points earlier point to some of the biases that um, I, I know I've seen in myself. When I get a manuscript that doesn't adhere to um, formatting, I have an initial impression about it. And I think it's really important um, to push through those initial biases and really assess manuscripts based on the content. Um, and be willing to work with authors um, who may not be as familiar with, um, um, with APA formatting style, particularly international authors, I think. Um, finally, um, the focus on journal impact factor. We had some discussions about this yesterday as well. Um, and it's, it's an important driving force for a lot of our journals today. Um, and while it's important not to be driven by them or controlled by them, I think that the reality for us as journal editors is that we know that several authors are looking at that when they're deciding um, which journals to submit their work to, um, particularly um, junior faculty who are um, trying to get their work at high in high quality journals. So we have to strike a balance um, in, in terms of just not being solely focused on um, journal impact factor indices. 
I'm going to skip to um, some opportunities. Um, there are a lot of opportunities available, I think, to address some of these challenges. One opportunity is to actively encourage or invite practitioners to submit manuscripts to the Journal for Consideration. It's not as easy, um, I think, as it sounds, but just last night, um, Mike Schaub had mentioned, well, invite me to do it. Um, and, you know, I'd do one if somebody, came, if a journal editor came up to me and invited me to do it. So instead of just opening up um, and having a general invitation, we, extending those and talking to practitioners um, about ideas that um, they might submit for manuscripts could be important. So establishing those relationships with the practitioners who, um, who can make some contributions. Um, developing opportunities to identify common goals between researchers and practitioners is also important. I know um, Seba and Pat, as our chair and chair-elect, have been doing a lot to, um, uh, to link uh, SVP with NCDA um, leaders to bring, bring together research and practice perspectives. And so similar efforts in establishing shared initiatives with leaders of other professional organizations can help us to advance the integration um, in these areas. Increasing um, practitioner scholarship and training um, within training programs, I think in career-related courses or in our practicum courses, um, faculty can select more career counseling applied readings. Um, within these courses to underscore the importance um, of involvement in the literature, even if students are pursuing practice-related careers. We can um, develop or solicit ideas for special issues um, on integrated topics and allow um, practitioners to propose their own ideas for special issues. And we can also facilitate collaborations between researchers and practitioners. We have several SVP members, I think, who are doing exemplary jobs um, at this. Um, Ellen McWhorter, Krista Cronister, um, David Bluestein, um, I think have um, really shown that the products and links within the communities can really produce uh, meaningful um, and important research. But that takes time, and I think that was mentioned yesterday um, also, also by Nadja. Um, if we're doing this, we also have to look at ways to, um, to impact the system and change um, universities to where um, these investments and these times and researchers who are doing this um, are not penalized in terms of um, merit evaluations or um, times when they're going up for promotion and tenure. So some recommendations on how um, editorial policies or practices can be changed. I think one of them is we can incentivize reviews. Um, it's challenging to find reviewers, um, not necessarily editorial board members, but ad hoc reviewers um, to review manuscripts. And um, time is money. Um, if there are ways that we can incentivize and provide some monetary, um, however small, um, uh, incentives for our reviewers, I think that would kind of be one step towards uh, widening the circle of folks who are reviewing our work. Um, there are also some journals who are providing CE credits um, for reviewers to, um, to do that, so for more practitioner-oriented um, reviewers. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, um, incorporating, um, working towards really making publishing and reviewing part of our culture and starting that um, in graduate school and in our courses and our programs. Um, we also need to educate, um, educate everybody on the um, submission process and the review process. I mean, for those of us who published um, regularly, it's daunting and it is hard and it's intimidating and um, we can't expect people who aren't uh, naturally inclined to that or have interest in that to persist um, when they are getting rejections, um, which is really the norm um, in the publishing field. So finding some way to, to break down some of the barriers and to increase knowledge about the um, submission process. Um, solicit collaborate, collaborative calls for proposals, um, identify barriers for submissions um, for practitioners. At our um, JCD editorial board meeting um, last year, there was discussion about um, soliciting short papers, like five to six page manuscripts. 
um, that would be more open to practitioners, individuals who don't have access to libraries um, uh, to develop full introductions and such. So, um, so that's something that we'll continue to explore um, with the editorial board member. I think in addition to um, uh, having impact factors for um, the use of our research, we can also look at developing some indices to assess impact for practice contributions. Um, so that um, so that as editors, that that's also being um, considered in the manuscripts that we're um, making decisions on. And um, similarly, recognizing outstanding integrative or um, practice-oriented um, papers with um, some awards, um, monetary awards, um, and some recognition for the work that these um, scholars are doing. Um, so I, I appreciated this opportunity again to do this and look forward to having more discussions with the editorial team and our editorial board um, on how we can do a better job of integrating these areas in the future. Thanks.